Hello and welcome to the 39th session of the uh, AI Safety Reading Group. Um, today we're going to talk about an article called Politics is Upstreams of AI by Raymond Brannan. Uh, I couldn't find a picture of Raymond Brannan, uh, even though I searched quite a bit. Um, but he's a writer and writes uh, at uh, a website called The Future Primaval. Um, with the uh, subtitle, Wiser Counsel for the Smarter Sort of Bro. Uh, that strikes me as kind of, uh, that makes the hair rise a bit, but uh, oh well. It's a group blog um, that call themselves neo-reactionary, uh, something called the Dark Enlightenment. Enlightenment. Um, I uh, couldn't find it really, I picked uh, Uncle Scrooge as a picture for a reactionary, that's not probably a really good example, and I'm not really sure what this Dark Enlightenment really is. So I think we should probably focus on the article itself. Yeah, I was thinking it has something to do with the alt right. So uh, actually, in the discussion uh, afterwards, which won't be recorded, um, I have uh, I have uh, some uh, thoughts about whether this can, in any reasonable ways, be said to be alt right or neo reactionary or have anything to do with that. But that's probably a contentious subject. So. I won't include it in the video. Um, the main uh, metaphor of the article, upstreams, is uh, like a river flowing from uh, somewhere to somewhere. And this means that um, politics in some way uh, dominates and determines how science is made, how science, what, sci what goals science have and uh, the paradigms and the uh, in in uh, in a very real sense, also the the scientific methods that are used. Um, the the article starts by giving some examples where there's uh, there's been a great degree of state control over science. Um, the first example is Lysenkoism, which was a um, um, a scientific theory about uh, how to grow h of agriculture that it was uh, gained a lot of political f favor in the Soviet Union, and because it was very very wrong, uh, it uh, held back the agricultural uh, production in, in the Soviet Union, uh, and a lot of people starved. Um, the, the two other examples are from Nazi Germany which uh, were realized that a lot of the physics were made by uh, were discovered by Jews and because they couldn't stand that Jews would be able to invent something that uh, Germans couldn't that uh, well not Germans that uh, Aryan people couldn't then they tried to m uh, reinvent physics without relativity and all these things uh, and that went very very poorly uh, uh, and they also had a, a cosmological theory that was even that was decidedly more crazy. Some guy, some German, had a dream vision where he dreamed, dreamt that the moon was made entirely of ice, and used that to uh, infer very, very many things about um, about the world uh, based on this. Let me just check if uh, I got a, a Skype sound. So I don't know if someone else came online. And um, maybe they did, and maybe they didn't. Hold on, I'll just real quickly see. No, they didn't. Okay, uh, I'll go back. Um, so uh, the the last example is from uh, uh, of uh, the state having a, a great degree of control over science is from a project that the United States did in trying to predict and control Latin America called Project Camelot and the later Politica, which was more predicting and less controlling. And the reason why this is uh, interesting is this is a, a military project where there's a, 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 an extremely clear, um, uh, what's it called, uh, hierarchy where the, um, um, there's a general on top from the army representing the state and then the scientists are explicitly below that, taking orders from the, uh, from the military command. Both of these projects were very small and ultimately uh, quite insignificant. So the power relations that most AI safety really think about is we have some researchers who are trying to uh, control an AI. And the, the point of this article is that the researchers are not just controlling the AI, there's a state on, on top that is also controlling the researchers and through those the AI. 
And um, how can the state control? Well, in two ways. There can be deliberate control. Obviously, if it's a state-funded project, there will be very, very real control. If there's a promising private pr project, it will be uh, nationalized. And the state has a very clear mandate from the people to, um, to control interesting uh, technology, control uh, technology with security implication, um, and the state will almost certainly, um, st uh, uh, Raymond Brannon, doesn't uh, really give an argument, but says in his analysis, it is clear that the state will participate, has decided to participate in an arms race. Um, so, um, in this way, the um, it's, it's impossible to, or it's very difficult to foresee an AI project that will not be state AI, at least in some, uh, in some sense. The other big problem is there could be misalignment. Uh, the researchers say we are building this project that will do this and this, and the bureaucrats hear something else. It's also possible that states are not unified, and so one department has this idea about how what to do with strong AI, and another uh, has some other things about this. And states um, are really made up of, uh, uh, can be seen as made up of particular factions that vie for control, and. Finally, uh, the state, the people uh, who have the power in the state might simply not con uh, understand what, uh, what AI really is and what it's capable of. So from this it's concluded that AI researchers n uh, need to study how, how this power relation works um, to, in order to uh, uh, account for the AI safety consequences. So the... the uh, the question that is often raised is whether math can save AI. And math is, of course, not mathematics like this, but um, uh, something like um, if you're building an AI that extrapolates human values. Last time we talked about uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky here on the right, um, coherent extrapolated volition, which I found this wonderful image. This is the sum of happiness. So I think this is a really, a really nice picture. Um, and um, the question is whether this will be implemented. And uh, Richard Brennan uh, is negative about this because the state will have some kind of political priorities that will supersede and override, um, even if Alicia Yudkowsky uh, and Miri was a a close to being able to implement uh, an AI with coherent extrapolated volition, they would be nationalized and um, uh, the mathematical, uh, even if it's a very beautiful uh, and simple uh, and um, you, you could call uh, coherent extrapolated volition, even if that was completely perfect, uh, then uh, the state might still be very, very able to, um, to come in and override it. Uh, and from this, uh, Richard Brandon concludes that uh, a serious AI project has has a big task in ensuring its um, uh, ideological integrity that uh, uh, it's not hijacked either by um, internal f uh, agents or uh, external uh, uh, like the agents like the state. At, uh, this uh, doesn't even have to be very very um, explicit and over like a nationalization is very very over. But uh, the programmers that are building the AI, uh, they also get uh, a lot of their um, ideas and um, ways of looking from the world uh, through um, uh, through the media and uh, books and and things that the state controls in some way. And this means that. Um, if the uh, AI, uh, the people building the AI are in some way um, intellectually naive, then uh, it will be much, uh, they will be very much under the control of the state. And this is a problem uh, that uh, where uh, Richard uh, Brand uh, concludes that the intellectual uh, background and moral education of the people who are building this AI uh, is, is a very critical factor. There's this garbage, here you can see two pictures, garbage in, garbage out. That if the AI researchers just, um, if you imagine uh, as a character, they're only re uh, looking at Fox News or something like that, then they might build an AI that really likes Donald Trump. Or, um, I don't know if that's 
counts as an example. Um, um, Yeah, uh, then yeah. Um, actually, here I uh, I actually uh, made a uh, rather grave mistake that I'm going to uh, talk about in the discussion because here I took in a contemporary political example when it was not necessary, and that's generally considered a bad thing. So I shouldn't do that. I'm uh, uh, sorry. I shouldn't do that. So um, in particular. The, the key to this moral education is historical data on human values, according to Richard Brennan. And I think here we get closer to some of the uh, uh, dark enlightenment uh, values, that there's very, very large uh, emphasis on the historical, and that's, that's the way you understand the world. As a, the, an example of where uh, AI could be really um, problematic would be a Soviet AI. If you imagine the Soviet Union creates an artificial intelligence, then how uh, could we, would we expect it to be friendly? Would we expect it, um, because it was uh, created in a mathematically perfect way, that it would then bring about paradise on the world um, or, uh, or have close to, uh, I mean, uh, it's quite possible that uh, Joseph Stalin, he um, he said some nice things about the workers internationally, but uh, what he, his true actions were very, very, uh, well, not human aligned, to be frank. Um, and this is, uh, this requires that the AI researchers are able to, in some way, resist uh, Stalin, if Stalin ordered them to build uh, an AI. And this seems like a very, very tall order, both to figure out that it's necessary to resist Joseph Stalin and to actually do that. So, um, the claim is in particular that political conflicts uh, are some of the, the things that make state control really, really dangerous and problematic. Um, things like uh, you have an AI, China have an AI, and um, these two are against each other. Uh, if there's an American AI and a Chinese AI, you can imagine them in a very antagonistic uh, relationship, and this uh, this could cause an arms race, and this could cause some values um, uh, and uh, and behavior that is very very non-human friendly. So um, this kind of thing has happened at some. Uh, or at least according to Richard Brennan, a number of reasonably comparable things have happened uh, in previous times. He mentions uh, yeah, the Napoleonic Wars, the World Wars, Communism, Manhattan Project, the Cuban Missile Crisis, as example where uh, this, uh, that, that AI researchers really, really need to learn from. Um, and, of course, this is a... Um, a different situation because uh, technology doesn't develop or use itself yet, as uh, Richard Brandon writes. And this means that um, once we get to have strong AI, um, this it, it will not be a directly comparable situation to, for instance, the world wars. Um, but it, it is still human agents and institutions that have a crucial uh, role in this. And it's a, it's an, uh, a mistake to think that it's uh, just an algorithmic problem. That uh, it's a mistake to think if we get the details of coherent extrapolated volition correct, then we are home free. The problem is that this is not might not, might very well not be the AI that is built. The it will be a political AI that will be built. So he has five moderately concrete re recommendations um, that I've. Uh, this is kind of a summary. Um, Study history of state influence on technology, in particular these examples that he has uh, uh, mentioned before, as well as the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project is, of course, also an, a hugely influential case. Um, and um, learn a lot from history, uh, in particular about human values and morality. Um, and figure out, if you have an AI uh, project, figure out what are the political threats and uh, defend against these both internally and externally and 
uh, study political history behind uh, uh, technological de- uh, development. That's the article. Thank you for listening. I'll now stop the recording and we'll go to uh, uh, the discussion. For the readers and for the listeners on YouTube, see you next week.